Sorry, dog. Hey, 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 no. What's going on, party people? We're live. It says we're live. So guess what? We are live. So it's Leona Carter. And I am, you know, I have a phenomenal, I call this a special edition with John J. Sims. <laughs> and so I'm excited to really share with you um, today about just some phenomenal, you know, kingdom entrepreneur perspectives. We're going to talk a little bit about marriage and relationships and all the things. So formerly, I am Leona Carter. I'm an intimacy and relationship coach for married women. And so uh, make sure you learn more about me at heycoachcarter.com. But also at that website, I have a marriage challenge coming up in just two days. And it's with counterculture marriages. And what that is, is four married couples, we come together for five days to pour into other married couples. So make sure you can also check that out at heycoachcarter.com. And so today I have a individual that's just a, 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 a pillar in the community of entrepreneurship, kingdom entrepreneurship. Now it's different when you add the kingdom to it. And his you know, what, what he brings to the body of Christ as an entrepreneur. It's just amazing. And I've, you know, connected with him on Clubhouse and he's part of, you know, Kingdom Business Network under um, Chandler Bailey and all the things. So I'm gonna let him introduce himself to you, but I'm telling you, you are in for a treat. So if you were going somewhere, if you're driving, turn up the volume, take notes, you will be able to watch the replay. This is going to be amazing. So welcome, John J. Sims. How are you, sir? Thank you so much for that humble and awesome introduction, Coach Leona Carter. I'm humbled to be a part of your show. Uh, man, you know, I guess your, your introduction was so phenomenal. You know, I feel like I don't have to say much, but uh, I'll just go ahead. Uh, my name is John Sims. As you stated, I am a full-time media and graphic specialist, and I uh, run a multimedia marketing firm called uh, Digital Pro Designs. So we really, and what that company does briefly, we help you reach your people needs by handling all of your digital needs. So we help you take care of things like your, your email blast, you know, your website, you need a landing page that converts so that you can get more clients. If you need a digital design for social media or for an email blast just to catch someone's eye, uh, we, we prioritize and making sure those things are excellent and taking those off your plate so that you can do what you do best when you, you can reach people gain more people and convert more revenue as you service people efficiently and effectively. We love doing that. Um, I also, you know, I just, you mentioned relationships. So I just uh, published a book, my very first book called why you should wait on marriage. Um, I've been single uh, for about, you know, since 2014. And during that process, God has taken me through a lot of different things of my own healing and wholeness process and giving me spiritual and whole wholeness and clarity on how to go through the healing process the right way. You know, during that time, he wouldn't even allow me to date anybody. He was like, John, I know you want to date this person, that person, but no, we're going to go through this process the right way. And he gave me a lot of insight and revelation on how to really get your spirit together and hold the right way when it comes to taking care of that process and going through that. So that's called Why You Should Wait on Marriage. And that's actually on waitonmarriage.com. If you go to waitonmarriage.com, there's a link to that book as well. Um, outside of that, I'm also a deacon at my local church and a media director there as well. So I love serving and empowering God's people in any way he sees, he sees fit. So right now, I just, I'm just i just looking for God to flow through us, flow through you, Coach Carter. Again, I'm privileged to be on here. So uh, I'm excited about being on. Awesome. Awesome. That's amazing. Doing some amazing things. So, you know, what? I wanted to dive into a conversation. You know, you, you have such a you know, a different perspective. I just love your perspective, you know, because I've noticed that you're, you're really want, you, you really in your life, you're, you're, you're really connecting with God. You're, you, you understand there was a song years ago called you are my personal Jesus. And I've seen you really exemplify that in your own life. So, you know, what is what is the what was relationship with God? What was the beginning of your relationship? What did that look like? And what does that look like now? Wow, that's that's a great question. That's a great in-depth question. I want to say, man, uh, it really went through layers. Um, I, I of course, you know, I did grow up in church, you know. Um, I actually got filled with the Holy Spirit at the age of like seven years old. Um, before I knew what any of it was, I got filled and spoke, and I didn't, you know, um, 
I didn't know what it was, but God kind of took me through a process. And I remember just being a young kid serving with my uncle. He had a ministry. He had moved us from, you know, he he had moved from New York, from Brooklyn, New York to Columbia, South Carolina. And my mom followed because he probably did one of the greatest things in our family. He introduced her to, you know, to Jesus and she ended up getting saved. So she came down as well, you know, and um, and and we, you know, we took a trip to Atlanta for one service. And that's how I got filled. And then after that, I was kind of like I, God was grooming me in ministry without me knowing it. I would follow him and he would he was always a fast walker, you know, uh, a fast paced person. And he would and I would be like 12, 13 years old. He's like, hey, get my Bible, get my Bible. Hey, hey, grab the water. And I, I was like, OK, get the water. And he's like and he and he was so meticulous. And I was like and I didn't realize it back then. But he would say things like it would be a, he, we would have services on Sundays and on Tuesday. And so on Tuesday nights, you know, um, I, would, I maybe we get him day signing. He was like, day signing. You don't drink day signing on Sundays. I'm like. I didn't say it because, you know, I want to honor my head. I'm like, really? Um, really? But, <laughs> but uh, you know, grew up in church. And then afterwards, you know, as I got like 18, 19, I kind of got out of church for a little bit, wanted to do my own thing. You know, sometimes we we had those perspectives. You know, I just I was like, God, I still honor you. I'm still going to send my time. But I'm, I'm kind of doing me right now. And then after that, you know, um, he, I, some, some certain things happened. You know, um, I, I had a lot of near death, a couple of near death experiences. I've been shot before, you know. Um, things of that nature. And then I was hard headed though. So that didn't make me continuously start coming back. Wow. It got kind of like dealt with me over the process and had me start coming back into ministry and slowly, but surely he, it was like, he gave me this grace, like, okay, I'm gonna let you do your thing right now because you think that's it. But when you find out that's not it, I'm mm -hmm. still here. And so it's been layers, you know, and I, now even more to the most recent to now that intimacy has grown. And one of the things that's blessed me so much about God is his consistency. He's so, so, so consistent, whether you're you're doing your own thing or whether you're um, whether you feel like you've gone too far out and you can't come back. God is so consistent. His love is so consistent. And right now I'm at this place really right now of peace. Like before, I remember being groomed in ministry and not knowing why or what, what I was being called to. But also and then getting to that point where I realized, OK, I have some type of purpose here on this earth and it's more than just about me. But God, I'm still discovering what that is. And down to now really being at peace with what that is and my knowing that my yes to God is really built off the intimacy that I built with him in this relationship because I've kept it real with him about everything now about stuff I'm feeling stuff that most men don't want to talk about whether it's emotions or things that you dealt with emotional trauma you know the emotional trauma hurt worse than a physical gunshot wound coach a lot of people don't understand mm. it the, the emotional Ooh, wait, pain wait, hurt wait, worse than wait a minute wait a minute you said emotional trauma hurts sometimes worse than the He's physical up. trauma okay yes okay i'm back i'm sorry about that i, I don't know why my internet went out like that but um oh yeah you the said emotional the emotional you said yes. the emotional trauma sometimes hurt worse than the physical yes. wait what does that mean what does that mean well, okay, for a quick uh quick segment, when I had um when I got shot, I got shot with a 45. I really wasn't supposed to have this arm no more. So it's a long scar. I got a I got a metal plate in this arm. But I didn't shed one single tear when I got shot. But I shed more tears than I can count when I got my heart broken. Wow. Yeah. So, well, that showed me that's two different levels of pain. And a lot of times we don't like to acknowledge it because I believe as men, we're taught that you address physical pain, you address emotional pain like you address physical pain. Pain. When you're a child, you're taught, hey, don't cry when you get cut because it makes you look weak. So it creates a signal in your mind that you think, well, I shouldn't cry when I get my heart broke either because, you know, at, because crying makes me look weak. And really, you end up suppressing pain. You end up suppressing emotional pain. But one of the biggest issues with that is that emotional pain doesn't heal like a physical pain does. So if you mm -hmm. get a stab, you don't have to address it. You can ignore it. Your body's going to heal on its own. But if you ignore that emotional pain, it's going to sit there and that wound is going to be remain open until you actually take it to a surgeon or you allow God to really deal with it. Wow, so, man, that that that's a that's powerful. I mean, you talked about that really that consistency with God that, you know, he shows up. You know, I mean, he loves us even when our actions sometimes seems unlovable. Like it yeah. is amazing how God showed that. That's what. And so now, you know what? I, I was in a room. I was in a room. When I say room, a clubhouse room. You know, clubhouse is a whole beast to itself, right? But yeah. you shared something so powerful in that clubhouse room. I was just like, wait, wait, wait a minute. 
Wait, you know, you know how they, um, Kevin Hart has a thing. Wait, don't just speed past that like you need to say what you said. Yeah. <laughs> it was so good. And you were talking about sometimes God asks us questions, but we get those questions mixed up. We think we're yeah. responding to this question when we should be responding to that question. Break yes. that down. Now, take your time because it's so good. I don't want people to miss it. But let us know what those questions are and how we should be responding. Yes. Okay. So that came from something. I can't remember what the conversation was. I think it, we, we talked about leave to go about two weeks ago. Yeah. And when God was I, that, none of that was written or notes or anything. He just kind of started giving it to me as we were talking. He started talking to me about the difference between leaving and going. We think they're the same, but they're not. And one of the illustrations he gave me is that when you leave someplace, you ask, when are we leaving? Or no, you know, what? when you leave someplace, you ask, why are we leaving? But when you go someplace, you ask, when are we going? A lot. So he really illustrated that there's a different W that attributes to each one. When you're leaving someplace, a lot of times people ask, well, why are you leaving? Why? So that means that goes to the W called the why. And when we're going somewhere, God says, hey, I want you to go here. You're like, OK, God, when? When are we going? And so that gave me the revelation of the two W's. A lot of times we're asking God the wrong W. We're asking God why are we going so why do you want me to leave some place versus asking when do you want me to go it's a difference and it is a huge posture difference in both because what ends up happening is the way he illustrated to me was almost like a parent with a child if i'm a father i don't have any kids yet but i believe you know once i get married i will god will have me have the children i want to have but if i had a child and they were going too close to the stove and i say hey go away from that you can't get that close i don't have time for them to ask me why because I'm concerned about their physical being. I don't want them getting burned. If I explain to them why and they get too close, it's too late. They get burned. The more important thing is when. I need you to go here, away from the stove. The when is way more important than the why. You can find Wait, out. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me pause you right there. That is so good. You related to, and listen, I have six kids. So I was like, oh, wait, I get that. I get that. Because sometimes in life, God is asking us to do something, but we procrastinate or stall with the wrong question. So we're saying, why do I need to go? Why did me? Yes. Why? And we're doing, and in the meantime, God needs you over here, but we're, we're self sabotaging the, the opportunity the, the thing that he wants to do because we're over processing, overthinking in the why when you're saying at that point, we need to be asking God, you want me here? When? You just let me, when do I, when do I leave now? Because sometimes when we get there, we'll find out things and it'll unfold when it needs, man. That, so why, what? what? Look at why, when, what, when, look, why, why do you think people feel like they need to ask why? Is it, why do people feel like they need to ask that why? Um, I want to say it happens with two things. One is a part of that is protection. When you have dealt with relationships, whether that's friendships or parents relationships or maybe extended family relationships and they've wronged you or it can make your trust wall go up. You mm. need to know, or even if you have bad business deals, you have to know, okay, before I do this, I need to know why. What's the motive behind it? What's the rationale behind this so that I make sure I'm protected? Or if you just have enough life experience, it becomes a default mechanism in our brain. It's, and a lot of times this could be wisdom because depending on who you're dealing with, you may need to know these things. However, another thing that helps breathe this is unfamiliarity. If you feel like you're unfamiliar with a certain relationship or it's not as familiar as, to, as it should be, there's not enough trust there for you to go through with something without asking why, without knowing wow. rationale. You prioritize rationale over timing. And one of the, another revelation I got was our GPS systems. When, our G, when, I'm, when we're driving a car in a GPS system, there's a level of trust that the timing is way more important to us than the rationale because we trust the GPS. So if the GPS says, hey, we're going to a place we've never been before, and it says, make a left turn here, make a right turn there. We don't ask the GPS why. We trust it because Come we trust on. the developers of that GPS system that they know what they're doing and that this GPS is leading us the right way. So the when is more important than the why because we trust 
the rationale of that more than you know, more than us needing to know why. And wow. That's, that's what happens with that. <laughs> that analogy, that's I mean, what can you imagine talking back to GPS? Why do why do I need to turn there? Why did but and so some so are you saying sometimes people have more faith in the GPS? Then they do in God. No, what? I'm not saying it, but our actions reflect that. Our actions reflect it because we believe that if we make these turns and everything that the GPS is telling us to make, we're going to get to our desired destination. We don't question it. We just believe I type this destination in. This is what it showed me. This is where we're going. Like we might check sometimes, just make sure that that's where it's going. But a lot of times out of 10, we're too busy just following the instructions that it gives us via audio. And then we get there when we get there. Many of us do not treat God that way when he's telling Ooh. us that we have a destination. I can't count how many times that God has showed us something. And I'm going to be personal. He showed me something. Hey, this is going to be the end and destination here. And I'm over here while he's telling me to make certain moves. Like, God, you sure? Or why are you doing it this way? For real? Like, I don't know if I would do it that way. And I end up missing out on, if I miss out on turns or directions while I'm doing that, guess what? What happens when we do that at GPS? You got to reroute and you delay your destination time. There's, oh. there's where I've delayed moments because God was like, I, I was telling you to turn here, but you didn't turn there. So now I got to reroute you. Wow. There. And he's never given me a reason. And the thing about it, coach, when we have a GPS, there's been at least one or two times where my GPS has steered me wrong. But I don't always second guess it when I go again. God has never steered me wrong. But I treat oh, him worse when I'm like, hey, you know, um, I need to know why. And I, I put the my rationale versus the timing. And when I, if I put the timing above the rationale, it means that I trust him. And that's what, I, that's what I'm even getting better at, even to this day, because I don't like to exclude myself out. This is a process that I'm walking with God daily as well. Man, that... Listen, that is proper. I had to slow that down. Like, wait, y'all, y'all catch this. Listen, people are already sharing this video and everything. This is amazing because we, so we're, we're, we're we want to know the why. So what happens? Give me a scenario, maybe even in your own life, when you say, you know what? I'm not concerned about the why because God told me to do it. I'm showing up in the wind. And I'll find out as time goes. What does that look like when you're you're not asking God why, but you're asking when? When do I pack? Mm. When do I? What does that look like? I had so I had a couple of those. If you don't get to that intimate level of God without Him extending your trust and saying, "Okay, I'm gonna see how much you trust me." So can you do this now? And I'm gonna even go back to the. I think you were on a clubhouse room yesterday, but I'm gonna mention it because this was I believe this was a destiny moment in my life. I remember I was a medical assistant at a doctor's office and this was probably, this was about, this had to be about easy, like 10 years ago. It was shortly after, at, shortly after I got shot, I felt like I needed to get my life back on track. So I ended up going to work in the medical field and this was around 2008. So I felt like I needed a secure job because it looked like things were in recession mode. And I was like, I need something that's going to be secure no matter what happens. So I worked there for probably like about eight months and, you know, I was planning on going to school to become a nurse and everything. And I felt like, African-American male nurse, I'm always have a job. That was the main, that was the reason. It wasn't about me seeking God, but I just felt like I wanted to do something productive with my life and be able to provide, provide for a family. And that would be a secure job. I worked there for eight months. And over time, as I was working there, I just started feeling, I didn't know the feeling was called conviction back then. I just had a feeling that this is not where I'm getting fulfilled at. And I remember um, it was like on a Monday, I finally broke down in a car on a lunch break. And I just, I'm in tears. And I'm like, I'm like, God, I don't, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm like, this is not it. And I was getting signs and signals from patients and all kinds of things. All kinds of things were happening. He was tugging on me. And in that car, I finally broke. I was like, God, you let me do this. And I know I was stubborn. I felt like this was it. This was the career. And I was like, I, I, I'm, I'm letting go. This, this is not it. And he was like, you're not supposed to be here because you care about these people way more than their physical health. And I couldn't minister to people spiritually at a doctor's office, you know, because it was like, contingencies and that's what my not my job description was but that was the feeling even before i knew what it was and he said okay now you gotta leave and but your leave date has to be thursday and it wasn't a two weeks notice i had a whole it was a whole bunch of questions like well where's my next paycheck gonna come from where, where am i gonna go to next you know how am i gonna pay bills how am i gonna pay car insurance etc but i knew i had to be obedient so i didn't ask any of those questions i knew he knew i had them but i was like 
I went in and I was obedient. I went in there Tuesday and I told I told my um my my manager at the office I was like, hey, um Thursday's gonna be my last day. I can't I can't stay. I didn't know what was gonna happen next. I just knew I had to be obedient to the when more than the why. I knew what he was doing. Wow, that and that takes a lot of trust in God. I mean, that takes a lot of trust in God. You know. You you relate it to Can I say something about that trust part just for that moment? Yes. It's gonna be real short. That then that moment, what happened was I knew for the for the very like of course I grew up in church, you know, I had seen external experiences with God. I even had some worship moments in ministry. But at that moment, when I was 23 years old, I knew for like the very first time I was hearing God clearly audibly in that car. I knew. And my rationale to that was I was because I was a stubborn person. My parents, my family, they'll tell you, we some stubborn people. We set our mind to do something. We ain't talking us out of it. And so my rationale was, and, and so my rationale was like, God, if I could be stubborn with all the ideas I gave myself to do, there's no way that I'm not going to be stubborn about something I know you're telling me to do when I finally know I'm hearing you. Mm -hmm. I remember coming back to the house. I told, I was telling people like my mom, my grandma was like, hey, I'm leaving that medical job. I'm not. I'm not standing no more. And my mom was like, she was like, what? And I remember my grandma, she's as stubborn as I am. She looked at first, she was about to say, don't you leave that job. But she saw my face. She saw my face and she was like, your decision already made. And I was like, I'm glad you know. <laughs> and But it was, that was my rationale. I just want to make that point. My rationale was, if I could be super stubborn with all the ideas I gave myself that I wanted to pursue that were, that were fleeting, there's no way I'm not going to have that same amount of stubbornness, if not more, with something I know in my heart God is telling me to do. Man, that that's powerful because that that right there, that quality that you've built, that muscle you've built over the years. Now, when God says something, you're going to do it. You know, yeah. like we build that muscle and it's like, look. But Leona, why why are you why are you doing that? You don't understand. I'm doing what God and you hold stubbornly right yes. to what God tells you to do. And it's a muscle you build over time. But but you you talked about how many times we relate naturally how we were heartbroken or or the trust that we have to, you know, the, the wall is up. Well, we take those same feelings to God and we relate like, God, why, why, why? Because last time I got hurt when so laugh and we relate those emotional mistrusts from human and we put them on God like he's going to do the same. But yeah. you also talked about how God is consistent. Yeah. I mean, that's that's powerful when you get to a point that you trust God too much to give up. You exactly. trust God too much. You trust God more than your reputation. You yeah. trust God more than what it looks like to other people. I mean, that, that you don't wake up like that, right? I know no. Beyonce did not no. have it right. <laughs> no. I woke up like this. You don't wake up like this trusting God at that level. And so if somebody is, you know, John at the left, you know, in their life, like, man, I, I question everything that God says and then question my own questions, right? Mm -hmm. What would you tell that individual? How do you work up to the place where you strengthen the muscle like you've done? That seems hard. I would say, and I want to, you know, I, I realize even more in this podcast, I'm an analogy person. So that's just where God speaks through me. I would say, well, you straight, you said muscle. So you treat it kind of like the gym. You know, if I, I, I tend to go to the gym two to three times a week, but if it's my first time at the gym, I'm not going to try to put three or four 45 plates on each side. I'm going to start off with maybe just the bar, maybe, or, or maybe just say, if I'm doing curls, maybe I might start off with a 10 pound weight versus trying to go up to 50. Cause I know I'm not ready for that. I can't handle that. I start small. So that's practical, but what does what does that look like powerfully when it's in a spiritual manner? Give God small things to allow Him to show Himself strong in your life. Allow Him to build build that relationship with the steps that you're at. I believe that God loves us so much that when we're in those baby steps of building a relationship with Him, He'll meet us where we are. For our, if our hearts right and our posture right, He'll meet us where we are. So 
I would, and so for an example, um, I did something, it was, it, this could be a baby step, but I, I do, I still do it just to practice even building my relationship more and more. I wanted to raise prices in, in my business on a certain, uh, on a certain item. And I was like, and I felt like God was dealing with me about it, but I was like, God, you know what? I said a simple prayer just on the way to the car. I was, I was walking. I was like, God, I feel like you're telling me to raise them up to this price. And if you are just confirm it. And the next day I get I get a confirmation on Pratt that I got a random text from my cousin. I know it wasn't random. He said, I don't know what you're about to do, but I felt like to tell you, go ahead and do it. Wow. I knew for me that was the confirmation. He didn't know nothing. My cousin knew nothing about. Um, now, of course, my, he's a person that hears God as well. So he was just a random person. But <laughs> it was, you know, I'm just got, got to put the pair of parameters on that. But he didn't know anything about my prayer the day before. I just knew that was God responding to me from what I prayed the day before. Wow. So start with something small. Give him a chance to act. Maybe uh, that small. And you know what, Leona Coach Carter, that small confirmation prayer. I got that idea from one of our um one of our youth ministry teenagers who because I because I served I served in um and, you know I just got finished I served ten years in our youth ministry over before I trained I just transitioned to a director of our media department for our main church last week. Oh, wow. That's been a blessing. But it was something I heard her say just in passing during a uh, youth ministry moment. That we had, I think, during the Wednesday night, she said, you know, sometimes I just pray and I ask God for confirmation. I'm like, God, you know what? I've never even done that. Tried that before. I was like, hey, I think you're dealing with me about this because a lot of times when I know he's dealing with me in something, I just kind of know and I just do it. But I want to practice this. I was like, confirm this if it's really you. And he gave me that. So if you're someone that's just starting out, start with something small. Start with something like if you if you had a thought that doesn't sound like you or nuts and, and you know it's a godly thought or something that is out of your comfort zone, ask God to confirm it. And do something small where he and that'll help build that relationship with him. That man, that's good because sometimes, you know, we feel like if we can't tackle the whole mountain, then we don't do anything. Mm -hmm. But to climb a whole mountain, you have to take one step at a time. That's yes. how you conquer the mountains in your life to say, I trusted God one step at a time. It got hard. One time when I took a step, I slipped back three steps, but I kept going and I reached the top of the mountain in my faith in whatever that is. That's, you know, that's an excellent advice because sometimes, you know, in, in a natural, I, I, I don't really like doing laundry, but if I do laundry, I want to be able to do it organized from beginning to end and if i can't do it organized like i want i don't do it at all mm. and so and sometimes we do that with our faith if we can't mm. you know we don't have the faith to trust god for the fifty thousand dollars we feel like trusting him smaller is is you want to everybody want to leap to the big thing but mm. you said start with the small thing get that practice build that muscle that is so good because you know i used to trust god for five dollars in my gas tank listen i was on that five dollars now my my faith is increasing a little bit more right i can ask for five thousand i'm 500 right you know and so it but it didn't start that way i didn't wake up like that right and yeah. so that's amazing so let me let me transition a little bit you wrote this amazing book, man, that you talking about really building that intimacy as a male, building that intimacy with God so that he can speak to you, you know? And so, um, first of all, remind us of what the name of your book is and what, you know, you talked about a little bit, but what, what, why that title and why now? Mm, okay, so that title is called "Why You Should Make Why You Should Wait on Marriage: A Spiritual Guide to Holiness, Clarity, and Self Development." And that title it just kind of, it just flowed out of me. It flowed out of me because it was it's, it wasn't something fabricated. I had to think of. It's literally what I'm doing. I, I'm literally waiting on marriage. But I felt like the reason I put the subtitle there, "A Spiritual Guide to Holiness, Clarity, and Self Development," because those I, I believe are three pivotal points about how God has been dealing with me on this walk as I wait on marriage, because I believe different people have hit it from different angles, but I feel like this was an angle that God wanted me to be transparent about because a lot of people might not necessarily want to address it. So 
in this perspective, I'm not just talking about this, the physical where, you know, you don't want to have sex till marriage. Cause I feel like that's been hit from different areas, which that's good. Of course, I'm full proponent of that. I believe that's God's will for you right. to wait for sexual intimacy, intimacy until marriage. But I really wanted to address other layers of this about how you, how you go to God and allow God to be your therapist when it comes to the things that you're dealing with emotional trauma or things that you might've suppressed or reasonings of things of why you might feel unfulfilled in certain areas, because the things that we might subconsciously think that marriage will heal, really they'll just expose. Ooh, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't, don't speed past that. Like you didn't just say what you said. <laughs> that, that is so good because as a relationship coach here, I am on the other side. And so, you know, when people think that marriage is a heal all or marriage is a cover all, right? And so you're talking about, let's deal with this now before you get married, yes. right? What, what is an example of something maybe you're working on or you've seen other people work on before instead of after? Uh, do you mean like a particular habit or just in? Yeah, yeah, just something that, yep, like a habit or something that, you know, emotionally that people just kind of oh, think it's no big deal. Okay, um, I'll be, and I'll be transparent and or, or this things I've dealt with. I've had exes where, and I'm not saying I'm the perfect one relationship because when I believe when a relationship ends, both people have their idiosyncrasies that caused it. It's never just all on one person. Now, one person might be a little bit more crazy, but there's always, <laughs> there's always two contributing factors from both people. So, I've had times where um where I've had exes where I felt like they were trying to make me their emotional um their emotional you know stronghold it, and I couldn't be that you know I couldn't be everything for you emotionally only God can be that but and now on the flip side of that the reason why I didn't address it is because in my heart I was also codependent on that as well I liked feeling needed now there's nothing wrong to desire to feel needed but you shouldn't depend on feeling needed. So we both had habits where I felt like, OK, they were overly emotional and putting all that weight on me to be able to to fix it and address everything. And me on the flip side, I did. I depended on being needed that way. So rather than me allowing God to be my holiness factor, one of my habits was them for emotional support and healing whenever I had a hard day at work or a long day dealing with clients. When really God was God was allowing me to see later on after I had clearer vision that he needed to be that and not my spouse or should I say not my who I thought would be my potential spouse. Wow, was, you that, call that, it habit. You said that wholeness factor, allowing yes. God to be your wholeness factor. And so, man, that's listen, that is so good because, you know, many times now, even in marriage. Sometimes if that's not worked out, like you're working on that ahead of time, if that's not, you know, if that process hasn't been started, then we get over to marriage and the spouse is the other spouse's wholeness factor. Yes. Uh, you know, it, uh, you know, our insecurities and all you're expecting me as a wife or husband, whoever's talking you're expecting me as a spouse to completely make you whole. But what if I'm broken? I might have some bad days. So if I have a bad day, automatically it means you're having a bad day. Like that wholeness factor. Wow. That how did how did you come to the to the realization of knowing that you needed God to be your wholeness factor? Well, th that was a process where I had to be led into because at first. I didn't I didn't just wake up after I, you know, after me and my ex broke up in 2014 and I figured, oh, you know, I need God to be my wholeness factor. It was more of me just almost like a child coming to a, to a parent with a wound. I had to go to God with a broken heart, literally like in my hands, like, OK, God, I thought this was you. It wasn't. How do I deal with this? And I didn't know what any of that looked like. I just knew I had to run to him. And what that looked like for me was creating worship moments. I would create worship moments in a room, in a closet, wherever I was, and just pour out to God, because I was like, nobody else can relate to this. I mean, for me, I knew it was tough that this was somebody I thought that for sure I was going to marry. And so when that all came crumbling out from the bottom, 
I was like, okay, God, I need you. So before I knew what wholeness looked like or what he was going to do, I just knew this part of me is broken and I need you. That was it. Mm. And he gave me, he gave me a power, powerful moments where I could sense his presence one. And then practically he gave me instructions. He gave me instructions literally to not date when it didn't make sense. You know, mm. gone on, got engaged and actually got married. And I had people trying to set me up. He literally would not let me date Coach Carter. And so I was like, OK, this makes no sense. But then <laughs> as I just it, I didn't you know, I, I just paid attention to the win right now. I can't yeah. date. He would literally wake me up at three in the morning. Hey, I told you not to be friends with her like that. What you doing? You, you, you can't respond to her. You got you got to make this right. And I'm like, wow, oh, you really waking me up at 3 a.m. And the Holy Spirit is sitting there like, you know why you up? You know exactly why you up. You know why I got you up. You you let her get your number. You let her have this whole fantasy in her head. And you you some of y'all just friends know what I told you. So he went, mm-hmm. and he's very blunt with me. So so it would be so it was so as I followed the instructions of the win, making it more important than a why. I had a whole bunch of whys. I'm like, gosh, she done went and got married. I can't go date nobody. I can't do this. Had to pay attention to the win. And then he would lead me and say, okay, now I'm going to show you the idiosyncrasies in your soul as to why you're not whole. But the only way I can do that is that I have your full attention and not trying to share it with you and whoever else you're trying to date. Well, you never Ooh, listen, I have your whole attention in this wholeness factor. Mm-hmm. I have your full attention, right? That's, that's amazing. I mean, you said so much rich i mean this is just rich it's it's really you know i love your heart i love you know all the things that you're able to do and and how you're able to really hear god and activate right and and know which questions to ask so man this has been amazing so just kind of as we're wrapping up so now i know your book is on amazon but you have a website that people can actually um, get your book now. Who do you recommend? Tell us what the website is, but tell us who is this book for? Okay, so the website is waitonmarriage.com. And the way that I wrote the book, even though it's called Why You Should Wait on Marriage A Spiritual Guide to Wholeness, Clarity, and Self Development, it's not just for single people. I, I've had some married people reading it that have been being blessed by it because, as you said, Coach Carter. Some people have maybe married already, but they haven't necessarily done this self-work. They haven't done this self-discovery of God. What are the idiosyncrasies of my soul that might necessarily need to be healed that I might be putting off on my spouse without realizing it? Um, what, what are those things? So I really address those things from my perspective and I address them from coming from a breakup and deciding to give God my whole attention. So it's, it's really I would say it's and it's not just not just for women. It's for women and for men. It's for guys who might might not necessarily think that they need to talk about this stuff but you need to because it's going to benefit your fu- your future family or your current family and your wife about how you process the things that you're going through and rather than talk about other people I talked about everything that I dealt with and I put with my heart out there on display and made myself vulnerable because I feel like God will use it to deliver whoever he wants to deliver it so in closing whoever that book is for anyone who feels like you need to be you need to go through a wholeness or a deliverance process and your soul spiritually get closer to God about how you can enjoy your life, even as the individual version of you, whether you're married or not. That's who it's for. Wow. That's, that is powerful because man, I mean, I'm, that's just, let me, let me breathe. Let me breathe because that's good. Cause you said, because some people are already married and they realize, Ooh, see what John's talking about. I, I didn't get to do this work. I didn't know what I didn't know. But now that I know better, you better believe I'm going to do better. That is amazing. So, John, thank you so much. This is this is a replayer. Folks, yes. if you just tune it in, this is a replayer. I mean, there's been, you know, a wealth of information shared here today. And so... Just as a reminder, you know, make sure, you know, I have a marriage challenge coming up in two days and you can register by going to counter culture marriages. You hear that S on the end of it? Marriages.com, counterculturemarriages.com and register for this challenge. But you might find that, you know what, I'm registering for the challenge, but I'm also getting his book because 
he's helping me. You know, this challenge is going to help me because I'm already married, but this book is going to help me because I didn't know that before I got married. And so this has been so amazing. I'm excited. So what is one last piece of advice before we close out that you want to say about anything, whether it's single guys, either anything. What, what is that one piece of advice, you know, as, you know, a kingdom entrepreneur, a single person, all the things that they really need to pay attention to moving forward? Um, it's very simple. I want to say your most important relationship is your relationship with God. I don't, that's not cliche. That's not any of that's that's nothing that I'm just saying on surface level, but that's that's coming from the core of my spirit right now when I say that. Every coach Leona Carter, everything that I do as a business owner, as a ministry worker, even as that I'm going to be when I become a husband or a father, all stems from my relationship with him. I go to God for my business. I ask him, you know, how how do you want me to handle my clients? How do you want me to send email blasts out? I go to him when I work with ministry, when I'm working with people. I go to him about before I get to know a young woman, if, he, if it's his will or not. And that is your most important thing. And it is not cliche. Mm -hmm. It is the truth. That's that's what I want to leave with. That's that's good. I mean, that that's everything. That's everything in my life as a wife, in a marriage, a mother of six in your life as a single young man, it's every, it's applicable for everybody's life. That is amazing. So listen, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, make sure you, you know, check out his book, check out the, the um, challenge. You, you've, you've got everything you need. You got your whole week set just from this episode alone. My name is Leona Carter and you can learn more about me at Hey, coachcarter.com. Bye for now.